Good morning, church. My name is Brian, and I'm the worship leader here at Harvest Fresno. We just want to encourage you, and thank you so much for joining us online. Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And one of the crazy things about this Christmas season is so many people just forget that we're celebrating this majestic, awesome, amazing God who sent his son to this earth so that we might have salvation. I want you to remember that this morning as we stand together or sit together and sing and raise our voices and praise the name of Jesus so that he is honored in this space this morning. Join with us.
Greetings, church. So glad you could join us and worship the Lord together. If you are new, we want to welcome you and uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. And uh, we would encourage you to visit our Harvest Fresno website and you could fill out a contact form and uh, let us know who you are. And if you have any prayer requests, we'd love to uh, pray for you. We will also be starting uh, small groups in the beginning of the year. So this will give you an opportunity to uh, plug into uh, small groups as well. And for those that uh, are usually with us, again, uh, so grateful for you and uh, your prayers. We covet your prayers as we navigate these challenging waters in terms of what is next and uh, which way the wind blows. And so we're just doing our very best to navigate and to uh, protect you and to uh, love you best. So thank you for uh, staying with us and, uh, and persevering with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, beautiful day and this uh, time together to worship you. Uh, We know that uh, we would never have uh, turned from uh, worshiping ourselves to worshiping the one true God were it not for your um, amazing grace. We are so grateful for your grace, for your love that was relentless in pursuing us. Uh, into your kingdom. And we are so grateful for the life and death of your Son who gave us uh, eternal life. And I pray, Lord, that it would be your words that go forth this morning that would touch the hearts and minds of all those that hear it, because we know that your word is able to do that. Your word is able to convict where conviction is needed, encourage where encouragement is needed, but ultimately work to change us. And that is our heart's desire is to be changed and conformed into the image of your Son. It is in his precious name we pray this. Amen. How many of you all have prayer lists? I bet a bunch of you do, right? Whether it's a mental prayer list or one that is written down or one that is uh, maybe a template of of a prayer list. What is uh, on that prayer list? Well, if you're like most people, you have prayers for family members and and friends and uh, your work and and different things. I I looked on the internet and I found some examples of prayer lists. And so here is one, as you can see, at the very top of the list, this prayer list, is uh, things that you're grateful for, which is a good thing. And it talks about your spouse and your Uh, children and siblings and parents, extended families, and it has temporal concerns, uh, jobs, uh, finances, school, guidance, and then, of course, missionaries and and friends who need help or people that are sick. And I I think that's a pretty typical prayer list. And here's another one found that has 31 prayer prompts. At the top of that, as you can see, is your your goals, your plans, um, sins to confess, A person that you're having a hard time loving. I hope that list isn't too big. Uh, Continue prayer for church and those that need salvation and political leaders. You know, things that are, I think, pretty typical of what's on most people's prayer lists. Those are good things. But I wonder what's on God's prayer list or if God would share his prayer list if he were one of us. And I think we have something along those lines because what we have in Scripture are the prayers of the apostles. We have prayers of the prophets. And in the portion of Scripture that we've landed on this morning, we have an example from Paul's prayer list for this young church. And it's from that where we're going to look at this morning. So if you have your Bibles or you want to look on the screen, we're going to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, final chapter here, in the first few verses, verses 1 to 5. It begins with, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. 
May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And from this passage, we're going to be looking at a prayer list that pleases the Lord. A prayer list that pre- pleases the Lord. If you recall, the main part of the letter uh, has just been concluded. He talked about uh, the second coming of Christ. He talked about the things that uh, needed to precede that before that happened, before the rapture of the church and before Christ comes back. He talked about all of those things. He talked about the Thessalonians persevering and, and enduring the, the difficulty, which would, we talked about was the, the tribulation period and uh, persecution. And so now he transitions and closes out the letter. And so from this, he kind of uh, reveals his heart for this young church, the Thessalonian church, which was uh, shortly planted before, before writing this second letter. And so from this, again, we're going to look at a prayer list that pleases the Lord. And the first thing is the advancement of the gospel. Is having that, number one on the prayer list, the advancement of the gospel. And we look at that from verse 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. So he begins with finally. And uh, Paul relies on the Greek term for uh, finally, which has, uh, how do you say this, Uh, several definitions. And the one that he uh, refers to here is the one that most preachers land on, and that means besides that, or, or still yet. So finally, of course, is more of a, uh, of a Jedi word trick to uh, perk up the ears of, of the listeners so that they uh, keep listening to the, to the preacher. So that's kind of peeling Uh, looking behind the curtain a little bit. So he says, finally, brothers, pray for us. So he seeks prayer for himself and the co-laborers that he is with. And it's a present tense, which is Paul is uh, imploring them to continually pray, and that uh, not just for, but in a sense, surround us with your prayers. Continually surround us, engulf us with your prayers. That is Paul. And again, we have to remember who is making this petition? It's Paul, the Apostle Paul. And Paul wrote most of the New Testament, more letters in the New Testament than anyone else. He, he was translated into the third heavens. He had the greatest missionary impact of the, of the church. Uh, apart from, from Christ, probably the, the greatest impact in, in Christendom. And yet it is He who's asking for prayer. Who is He asking prayer from? <laughs> Young believers. Baby believers. He's, he's asking for prayer from people that are spiritually less mature than He. Why? Why? Because we're all equal, and the prayer goes to whom? To the one who's all-powerful. If you are a regenerate believer, you have access to the, to the throne of, of God, just like the most mature believer. And Paul is showing his, his humility, his, his great dependence on the Lord for all the things that he has done. All of his co- accomplishments, as, as he often does, he gives credit to the Lord, as he did in Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. He says, For this I toil, struggling with his energy, that he uh, powerfully works within me. It's God that works. And what we do is we we see that he's treating them as an equal. He's a a needy beggar going to baby Christians for prayer. Because we never arrive at a place in our Christian walk where we are independent from God. We are never so mature in our faith that we are above any temptation. We are never that along the path in our sanctification where we do not need prayer. We are all dependent. 
on the Lord, and that's what He shows. And <clears throat> the Scriptures are filled with, with Paul, of course, praying for um, the people to whom he ministered to, but also asking for prayer. <laughs> he knows it links, it links us to the, the throne of the universe, that it connects us with the mind and the heart of, of God. Prayer is the greatest force in the universe. Greater than gravity, greater than electricity, greater than uh, magnetic for any magnetic force, because it appeals to the God who created all of those things. And so he's asking this young church to pray for him. And I just want to say that there's nothing that is more encouraging and, and warms my heart to know that, that you're praying for me and that you're praying for my family and that you are praying for the leaders of this church. It is the greatest blessing that we could ever receive, and we are so grateful that this is a praying church and that you pray for your church. So, continuing, we see what is Paul's burden. What does he ask prayer for? He could have asked for a lot of things. He's, he's dependent day by day upon the Lord for, for provision, but he doesn't ask for provision. What does he ask for? The salvation of souls. First thing, number one on the prayer list, gospel advancement, the salvation of souls. He says, finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. The word of the Lord, what is that? The word of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the, the word from Jesus Christ, and it is the word about Jesus Christ. In other words, it's the gospel. He said that the gospel would speed ahead, make progress, be unobstructed, unhindered in its work. This is language taken from Psalm 147, verses 15, where um, the psalmist says, uh, He sends out His command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He talks about God controlling all of these things in the same way that He spreads snow on the land and, and, uh, and, the, and winter weather. He sends out His, his word. He's in control of that. And so he asks that the, the message that he is able to um, spread the message with, with, with the other apostles, with the other missionaries, that it, it would spread quickly. It would sp 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 be spread rapidly. That it would be <clears throat> uh, spread in a, in a way that, that goes far beyond where he is right now. He's asking that it be spread from person to person, from house to house, from city to city. This is a desire for, Paul, for the people to know the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the Lord that offers forgiveness for sinners through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who rose on the third day and ascended into heaven. We put our faith and trust in Christ for our forgiveness of our sins, then we have new life. And that's what he's praying for. And he continues and says that the, Lord may, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as it happened among you. So he's talking about that the word of the Lord may be honored. And the word for honored is uh, a word that we often use to, um, that is used to be um, glorified. That it, the word is the same word that is often translated glorified. It's praised. It's exalted. It's magnified. That God is magnified through the, through the spreading of His Word. Well, how is that? Well, <laughs> that is because the Word is connected to God. That the Word and God are inextricably linked. That you can't have or know God apart from the Word. The Word brings us and gives us knowledge, revelation of who God is, who we are, and how we, one can be saved. So all of that is connected, and when that happens, God is glorified. And He's glorified how? Well, when people uh, receive the Lord, they become a new creation. They turn from being a worshiper of self to becoming a worshiper of the one true God. In Acts chapter 13... Verses 48 and 49, we see uh, Paul preaching. 
in, uh, in Antioch, and he talks about the acceptance of the gospel among the Gentiles. In fact, I'll start at verse 47 so you get some context. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So we see here that when they received that, received the word, that they glorified God. And we see here that they were ones who were appointed to eternal life. And they were the ones who ultimately were able to glorify God because how? They became a new creation. We, you, you, you became someone who was a slave to sin, now one who is a slave to righteousness. You now have the ability to, to reflect God's attributes back to Him, His mercy, His grace, His goodness, His kindness, His love, back to Him, and that's how we glorify Him. That's how the spreading the Word of the Lord ends up glorifying God because it makes people into new creations, reflectors of His glory. And so living a transformed life is, is how that's, that's done. Now, this is coming on the back of, of Paul really talking about sovereign election, and uh, then now he's talking about asking for prayer, that the gospel go out, and you say, how does that quite work? Well, it, it works this way in the sense that God's the one who saves. We're, we're praying that, that the word would go out. The gospel is the power of God until salvation. We're praying that that goes out and that God does a mighty work in the hearts of the people who hear the word. That's the only way one could be saved. It doesn't rely on, on our intelligence. It doesn't require our, how persuasive we are. It matters on the power of God. We just have to be faithful to deliver the historical message that Jesus saves. And that is our obligation in this. It's God who does the work. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 10 makes it very clear. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the uh, eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and, I shall, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So here you have the power of God working through His word, that it will not come back empty. Many translations have void. God's Word goes out, it accomplishes its purpose. It accomplishes everything that God intends to accomplish through His Word. And that's a comfort. That's a comfort in knowing when you're evangelizing someone again that, that it's the power of God, that God's going to accomplish it, that there's no heart that's too hard for God to penetrate, that it doesn't matter how far someone is in their sin, how, how, rock, how you think they've hit rock bottom, they just have a shovel and they keep digging and going lower and lower. It doesn't matter. God can lift him out out of any hole because he's the one who saves. That's his power. And so this is number one on the prayer list, that the, that the word of God would, would spread, run quickly throughout the, the region and for people to be glorified. It's a quick survey of how, what's happened since. In the 2,000 years since this, over 2,000 years since this has happened, Right? Salvation began in the Middle East, right? Right there where, where Jesus was in, in Jerusalem. And it, and it spread to the Near East and then Europe and then eventually the Americas. And then the big uh, Protestant uh, uh, revival was in, in Europe. And then it spread to the, to the United States. And so it was basically uh, Europe and North America where most Christians lived. But that has changed. That has changed drastically. There's a report in 1910, the 10 nations with the largest population of Protestants were in Europe, the former British colonies, and the United States, Canada, and Australia. But that has changed. Today, 41% of 
Protestants live in Africa. According to the study of global Christianity at Gordon, uh, Gordon Conwell uh, uh, Theological Seminary, by 2050, it will turn to 53%. Pew uh, Research found that 23% of Americans raised in Christians no longer identify themselves with Christianity. So it's going down in the United States and going up in these other regions. In fact, the, the nation of the ten, the, with the fastest growth of, of Protestants, we have a list. Rwanda, Burundi, the Ivory Coast, um, Burkina Faso, Chad, Vietnam, Central Africa Republic, the Republic of Congo. We have the Philippines and uh, Nepal. Look at how that is spreading, where it's spreading. In fact, right now in Iran, Christianity is the fastest growing religion, growing at 5.1%. In China, it's the fastest growing religion. So it's moved from the United States and and Europe in terms of where the growth is to, to these regions. So what does that tell us about what we need to do? We need to evangelize. <clears throat> here at home, it's declining here at home. Our neighbors, those around us, <clears throat> they need to hear the gospel. There's a much greater chance of someone growing up right now in the United States of not hearing the gospel than at any time before uh, in, since the United States was, was conceived. That's a, that's a terrifying statistic. So here we are. So now it's urgent for us to pray for the gospel to advance where our passions and our energy can be deployed in that. It's for prayer. It's just, it's, we need it because it's so easy to get distracted. Our prayer, number one on our prayer list. It's often selfish things that we ask for. And it's not wrong to ask God to help you do things that are for yourself. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that here we have an example of just being so other-minded focused. And not just other-minded focused. Thinking about the eternal. Praying for things that have eternal value. You can't ask for something more valuable than that. We're consumed with these temporal matters. Think about how much time, is, you know, when we pray, uh, we, we, how much time we do other things instead of pray. How much time is spent on, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these other things. And in, a, in and of themselves, they're not bad. It's just whether we have self-control, whether we can use them properly, whether they use us or we use them. So we need to focus because the good can cannibalize the better, and the better is advancing the kingdom. So that brings us to the second request, and that's divine protection, verse 2. <clears throat> and that we may be, be delivered from the wicked and evil men, <clears throat> for not all have faith. So he prays first for the advancement of the gospel, but also, secondly, that <clears throat> the messengers of that advancement would be protected <clears throat> from the evil. Excuse me be opposition to the gospel. The world, when the light goes out, the world, unbelievers hate the light. That's just, that's how things are. There will always be opposition to anything spiritual and to the gospel. So the desire that he has is for the messengers of the gospel to be protected. <clears throat> and it's not for their personal safety. The, the, what he's asking for is they be delivered for, there's a purpose. It's connected to the advancement of the gospel. That they'd basically be protected so that they could advance the gospel. That, in other words, that they're, they're protected so that they'd be unhindered in their ability to share the gospel. So he prays for deliverance from wicked and evil men. Again, <clears throat> this prayer, Paul's life was always in danger. So this, this is a prayer for uh, deliverance, and again, that he won't be hindered from presenting the gospel. And he talks about evil men. <clears throat> this is um, 
This is, uh, well, excuse me, first wicked men. And this is an interesting word. It's, it's a word that literally means those that are out of place. As some people say improper. And then evil, which is, again is this uh, act of evil. So who are these people? Who are these wicked and evil men that are hindering the gospel? Well, I think we have to look uh, on in that, uh, in that sentence, for the next sentence says, for not all have faith. So that gives us a little bit of a clue. So there's, there were two main uh, opponents to the, to the gospel. They're the Judaizers, right? Those were the first ones who opposed the gospel um, where in uh, Thessalonica where he was. They um, were the ones from the synagogue, and they uh, rallied the, the people, and they came against uh, uh, Paul and the fellow missionaries there. And that has been a typical enemy of the gospel from the time that Paul went out and uh, planted churches. It was the Judaizers. But now we see here that it might be a different group of people. Why? Because he says that they are out of place, number one, and it says not all have faith. And that would be a very strange thing to say about someone who is a pagan. So, you know, you don't, of course a pagan doesn't have faith. But to say that is that they were out of place and that they don't all have faith makes us think that they might be the ones that are among them, those that are professing Christians. And we know that the professing Christians, those that are within the church, the tares inside the church, pose the greatest threat to the church. This is not new. Paul warned the uh, elders uh, from uh, Ephesus about this very thing in Acts chapter 20, verse 29 to 30. You don't have it, I'll just read it very quickly. Uh, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. From Again, so from your own selves will arise men saying twisted things. And, of course, we know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 to 15, that Satan disguises himself as what? As an angel of light. And, again, we could see that in verse 14. And no wonder that even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So, they are servants of Satan who disguise themselves as servants of what? Righteousness, meaning Christians. So we see here that those who are in the church pose a great enemy, and they're really uh, servants of Satan. Again, this is uh, very clearly illustrated with the example of Judas, right? <laughs> Judas lived with Jesus for three years. He went with him wherever he went. He had intimate knowledge of, of Jesus, was one of the apostles. And yet, we know what? He betrayed Jesus. And in that, what happened? How did that occur? Well, in John chapter 13, verse 27, at the Lord's uh, Supper, Jesus, then after taking the morsel... Uh, Judas taking the morsel, Satan entered him, into him. And Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. So the, the enemy, the devil, entered into Judas. And so we see that, some, that the devil actually works inside of, of people to cause them to, to do things. In this case, was to betray Jesus and to kill him. So, Paul looks to this young, vibrant church and asks them to pray for, for the safety of the messengers, that, they, that the evil and wicked people would not, who oppose the gospel would not hinder the advancement of the gospel. And so, is that on your prayer list? Because you have to have a little bit of knowledge and insight about what's going on. If these are truly professing Christians, then... How, what do you, how, and how do you pray? Well, you, you may know some. Well, who is causing division? Who's causing discourse? Discord. Right? 
We, we did a whole series on spiritual warfare. What, what are the tactics, what are the schemes of the evil one? Division, right? Discouragement. Is, is there someone who's just constantly bringing you down? Who, who at the end of the day, is causing you to, to go further away from, from the Lord? Well, that could be an enemy of, that could be a terror. That could be someone who's hindering the gospel. Is there someone who discourages you from going to church and being part of the church, or is there someone who encourages you to, encourages you to do that? If someone is discouraging you that, to, to, from doing that, they're discouraging you from being part of the body of Christ. Well, that's how the enemy works. He, he, he divides and conquers. He, he separates you from the, from the source of strength and God's grace, which he deposited in the church, and he separates believers from being connected to that power and that strength and that community and that fellowship and the hearing the Word. And so when you are drawn away from the Word of God, when you're drawn away from the community of, of the Lord, then you know what is happening. So we have to pray for that, pray against that. And that leads us to the next item on the prayer list. We see a prayer list that pre- pleases the Lord. As a, we pray for the advancement of the gospel. We pray for divine protection. And we pray for greater trust in the Lord. Verse 3, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So here again, he kind of recognizes and, and reveals that it's the evil one behind these, these wicked and evil people that are doing things to hinder the gospel. But the point is, he's saying, you can trust the Lord. He transitions from the faithlessness of men to the faithfulness of the Lord. That's what Paul is doing here. And so, he, he's encouraged because he knows that God is faithful. And he will establish and guard you. Establish, fix you. Put you on solid ground. That, that you are well-grounded, that your reliance is going to be on, on the Lord. And he will guard you. That's a military term for, for keeping you uh, a sentry, for, for keeping one safe. And again, this is, this is all, all relative in the sense of what we're talking about here. It's, it's safe, safety from the evil one. It, it's, it's, it's knowing that you are eternally secure in the Lord. That the, that the enemy could come against you, can attack you, but he can't enter, enter a believer, and he can't cause you not to be with the Lord forever and ever. But he's praying now for that it's based on the trustworthiness of the Lord. The power for protection is in the Lord. One little word will fell him, as, as Martin Luther wrote in A Mighty Fortress is Our, is our God. He will not allow Satan to go beyond a certain point. The devil is God's devil. He allows him power. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is the ruler, the God of this, of this world. He was able to uh, deliver kingdoms to Christ. He's in control of all of these, of these uh, political systems and, and governments. God is above it, but he has power, but only the power that is delegated by the Lord. And we know that God is faithful and won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but He will always provide an escape. So we have safety. We have God's grace that will always enable us to endure whatever the enemy throws our way. And so we need to pray for that. We have to pray for us to be faithful and realize that God is the one who's faithful. That our, that our relationship with Him isn't dependent on us. It's dependent on the God who has His strong arms around us. Thank the Lord for that. I would never be saved or never stay saved if, if salvation depended on me. It's dependent wholly on the Lord. And so, God is faithful. All His promises are are true and amen, are yes and amen. They, everything He said is true. Everything He says is reliable. Our, our hope is anchored in His faithfulness. <laughs> in, the, in the midst of a fallen world, 
We can't put any hope in any man. It's a fool's errand to put our trust and our hope in an in a individual. It, it, it doesn't matter if it's your spouse. It doesn't matter if, if it's a, a pastor. It doesn't matter who. If he's a man, he's going to fail you. Can't help you. God can help you. God's the one, only one who is able. And so, <laughs> we again are told that there's going to be opposition to the gospel, right? We're going to be attacked. All who desire to live godly lives will, you know, will face tribulation and difficulties and challenges, right? We know all these things. And the deliverance, the safety, the, the trust in the Lord, what He's providing is that we will be with Him forever. Yes, we may die. Our physical bodies may die. But we will be with Him forever. The enemy can't kill the soul. God is the one who, who keeps us. So we have to rely on His faithfulness, as Jeremiah wrote in Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. That, that, is, that should be the, the cry, the prayer of all the saints. Each and every morning, relying on the mercies and the steadfast love of the Lord. There's an example of George Mueller, who you've heard me talk about. He had a, a largest orphanage in, in London. And he desired to glorify God by always depending on the Lord for provision. He, he, he never sent out a request for, uh, for donations. He always relied. It was just between him and the Lord. And again, there were times when there was no food, and a milk truck or a bread truck would break down in front of the orphanage and, and provide food. It was just one case after another, and it's uh, chronicled. He has an autobiography. Or bi- there's a, bi- a number of biographies that, that chronicle the, just the amazing ways in which George Mueller trusted the Lord, and the Lord always provided. No matter what the naysayers said, they were told, he was told a number of times that this was going to fail and that he was going to have to close up, but God was faithful. A prayer list that pleases the Lord. Pray for the advancement of the gospel. Pray for divine protection. Pray for greater trust in the Lord and greater obedience. And greater obedience, verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. So here's Paul's confidence, again, is in what? In the Lord. Specifically says, our confidence is in the Lord regarding the Thessalonians, continuing uh, obedience. The things that they are obedient to are commands. These are the commands that we have uh, in Scripture that uh, Paul communicates in his, uh, in his epistles that they are, again, from the Lord. And there's today a lot of pushback about obedience to the commands of the Lord. You're called legalistic very quickly if you uh, exhort people to, to obedience. But this is just part of the great commandment. Excuse me, the, the, the Great Commission. In, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, you know this well, starting in 19, Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What is teaching you to observe all that I have commanded? That's obedience. That's just another way of, of saying, uh, teaching obedience. And when we're uh, obedient to the Lord, we're in, the, we're in His sweet spot. People are constantly saying, well, I just want to do uh, the will of the Lord. I, I want to know God's will. 
in a situation. Well, be obedient. Do what God tells you to do. do. He has revealed so much to us of what we're to do, how we're to live our lives, how we're to interact with each other, how we're to interact with God, how we're going to interact in our workplace, how a husband is to react to a, and interact with his wife and the wife with, his, with her husband and us as parents with our children. He's revealed so much to us and we just have to be obedient. That's the will of the Lord. And so there's things that we want. And there's ultimately a point of decision. Am I going to do something my way or God's way? And we have a Y chart if you look at this. So you have something happening. There's a, there's, it starts with our thinking, right? And the thinking is that are we going to do things my way or God's way? And the thing about doing something my way or out of selfish motives, right? It, it looks easy. It looks easy. Doing things God's way is hard. There are some sacrifices you have to make. You, you, have, to, you have to humble yourself, right? You're, you're in an argument and, and uh, you think you're right and you're waiting. You're going to cross your arms and you're going to wait for the other person to admit that they're sorry and, and seek your forgiveness because they were in the wrong. Right? But God wants us to be a peacemaker. God wants us to, to drop whatever is at the altar and go. And if we know if someone has an offense against us, that we go out and we be reconciled with them. That we own whatever part of, of the offense, whatever the argument was about. There's, there's always two parties, and whatever that is, we need to be the first one to seek forgiveness from that other person. Right? It's hard to humble yourself. And so we see here that there's the easy way. That's just, I'm not going to deal with it. Right? I'm just going to give that person the silent treatment. I want to interact with that person. It looks easy. But then it gets hard. <laughs> And the Proverbs makes it very clear. Proverbs 13, 15, the way of the King James, the way of a transgressor is hard. You want to do things your way? You want to sin? It's going to be hard. It looks easy, but it's going to be hard. Now, God's way, it's, oh, I have to humble myself. Hard. But then what happens? How God's grace gets poured on you. Lavishes. God lavishes His grace upon you. And he makes it easy. And so then you're, you're in the sweet spot of his will when you are obedient to him. And then things start, you start getting green lights and things start going your way. And it just, there's a burden that's lifted from you. And you have peace. That's doing it God's way. And lastly on the prayer list is a greater understanding of God's love and faithfulness. Verse 5. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So he direct is, is point you to the point where all the obstacles are, are removed. He, he directs you. He, he guides you. He, he opens a path for you, a road for you that's unblocked, unhindered. And so Paul, the prayer is that the Lord would direct our hearts to the love of God in the steadfastness of Christ, so that our inner hearts will be moved to a point where we would have a greater understanding of God's love for us. That's, that's the only thing that's going to really motivate us at the end of the day. Yes, there's a healthy fear of the Lord that we should all have. There's a healthy reverence that if I do something that, that's against God, that I could get chastised for that. And that's good and that's real. But you're going to start playing odds with what, how much you're going to get away with before something happens. And in fact, you go a long time before something happens. It's the love of God, understanding that love that God has for you that is ultimately going to enable you to live a life for Him. 
to produce that obedience that we're talking about. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And the only way we're going to love God is knowing that He loved us. That's the only way. And when you reflect on the love that God has for you, when you have a right understanding of who you are, who you were, the sacrifice that God made sending His only begotten Son to to live in this sin-infested world, to be ridiculed, mocked, and, and strung up on a cross and die for your sins. When you understand that love, that changes you. That motivates you. And also, he talks about the steadfastness of Christ. And again, it's, it's Christ enduring the Incarnation. That separation from that, that eternal glory that he had experienced for all of eternity coming down in the form of a man, in the likeness of man, hungry, thirsty, tired, subject to temptation, and of course, enduring the cross. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of the faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is Jesus' example of endurance, of his steadfastness, that he, he was unmoved in his desire to be crucified for you. Nothing, nothing was going to keep him from the cross to save you. And all of this is rooted in God's love for you. And when we think about the sacrifice of Christ and you put all of this together, and knowing that nothing could separate you from the love of, of Christ, Jesus, that changes you. That enables us to persevere. That, that, that gives us the, the heart of, of obedience. But, but you have to know the Lord. He, he loves you, but He wants you then to love Him out of, and then obey Him out of knowing Him. I, I heard this one time. I don't even remember where. I'm, it's, it sounds like Piper, but if you know me and you know Sonia, and I went to Sonia and I said, I, I just love your blonde hair and, and green eyes. Or they sparkle. They just light up my day. You would know that I would be in ICU. Because if you know, Sonia has dark hair. Brunette, she's a brunette, right? And doesn't have green eyes, right? But that's what we do with the Lord. We, we make up a God that we want to love. And that is not true love. That's loving something else. That's, that's idolatry. That's a counterfeit God that we are worshiping and that we are loving. We have to love God as he's revealed himself to us. And when we do that, oh, the gates of heaven open. There's joy. There's peace. There's salvation. There's protection. And there's a joy that's unspeakable. That's the prayer list. Is that your prayer list? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are, we are so grateful for, for your word, for your truth, for your great love that you have uh, for us. And Lord, we are often so negligent about our prayers. We try to do things in our, in our own strength and it's only after a period of time where things aren't going right where we may turn to you. But I pray, Lord, that we would recognize uh, the power that you have, the power that you have, and the privilege that you have given us by the ability to come before your throne of grace and make our, our prayers and supplications known to you when you are a God who hears your children. You are all powerful, that there's nothing hard for you that you are loving, that even on our worst day, that you love us just as much as 
on our best day because your love for us isn't predicated or based on what we do, but based on what your son did for us. So I pray, Lord, that we would have a greater understanding and appreciation of your love for us and the steadfastness of your son, the love that's represented in the gospel, and that we would live our lives for you and have prayers that correspond with that. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. Uh, this morning. If you know anyone who might benefit from hearing uh, this message, then please feel free to share it. And know that it's also available on YouTube on our Harvest Fresno uh, channel. And uh, again, uh, we are going to be meeting online uh, only until the end of the year, but we are very optimistic about our ability to uh, gather after that. So again, we thank you for uh, being with us and uh, worshiping the Lord together and know that you are loved. 